In this walk and talk mock video, I'm going to be exploring two example questions for Literature Paper 2, Section A. And just to remind you that the texts that you've been studying for the last couple of years is Willie Russell's Blood Brothers. Okay. If you've watched previous videos, you should know exactly how to go about finding the questions. But just to remind you that you have not studied any of the texts such as Sinophore, Animal Farm and so on, you have to use the contents page in the exam booklet to find these questions. That takes a matter of seconds but it will help you to avoid making silly mistakes in trying to answer on questions or texts that you have never studied. Okay. As I mentioned in the previous video, you will be presented with a choice of questions. Okay. Two questions in the Blood Brothers section and this very small word at the top here is very very important. It says or. It does not say and. That means that you have to look at both questions and you have to make an informed decision as to which one you feel most confident in answering. And Now that's going to take you a little bit of time. As previously mentioned in other videos, in this section, you would have 45 minutes. That's an awful lot of time. And what I would suggest is that you need to use a minimum of 10 minutes to create a plan and to think. Never just rush into answering any questions in any of your exams without having some planning and thinking time. And I think that you should be writing, actually physically writing, for 30 to 35 minutes right time. Okay. Now if we're working on roughly five minutes for a PISA paragraph, then that means that you should be able to get about six done as a minimum in this time. Now that will probably be about two pages, maybe a bit more, which is about the volume that I think you should be writing as a minimum in order to be able to demonstrate your skills and knowledge to your examiner. That's only five minutes per PISA and you should be able to practice that using the sample papers that you've been given by your teachers. So back to the questions. Okay. In this example, we've got question three, which says, how does Russell present the narrator as an important character in the play Blood Brothers? It says, what does the narrator do in the play and how Russell presents the narrator uh, as an important character? Can I just remind you of this small word, that is very, very important in both English language and in English literature. How secretly means methods. What methods does, in this case Willie Russell, does the author use to create their narrative, their characters, their themes, their ideas? So we've got how does Russell present, and now present, just means show. How does Russell show the narrator as an important character in the play? So we're thinking about what the narrator does and then methods used to show him. So the first thing you should be doing is having a little think. Well, what do I know about the narrator? What does he do? Where does he appear? What do I know about him? Okay. And I would take some time to consider that question You've got 10 minutes thinking and planning time. That is a significant amount of time and you should not rush your decision. You definitely shouldn't just do this question first because it's the first one that you see. And as part of this process, I'd be thinking, well, what do I know the narrator says? Well, you should be revising key quotes that the characters say, key things that the characters do, and I know that some of the quotes that spring to mind with the narrator is he talks about the threat of Jesus and the devil and religious kind of retribution, okay? The idea that he's an omnipotent character, that he's all-seeing and all-knowing, and he knows the inner secrets and desires of all of the characters on stage. He says, in the name of Jesus, the thing was done. Reaching out with sort of religious views uh, that would the audience would relate to, and the characters would relate to as well. Remember, kind of Irish Catholic backgrounds of many people, the working classes in Liverpool um, at the time. This will have uh, this will have uh, been seen as a warning by many of the audience members and also the characters as well. 
He says a debt is a debt that must be paid. This idea of consumerism to do with Baudelaire and the fact that we live in a simulated reality where everybody wants everything um, almost instantly um, without any remorse and the fact that we are unaccustomed to things being bad or negative or sad and that we want to live in this simulated reality where we don't want to live up to the consequences of our actions. Um, Willie Russell reminds us through the narrator that there are consequences to our actions, that the things that we do we will have to cough up and pay for either physically, which is shown very literally with Mrs Johnston and her inability to pay for the possessions that she takes out of the catalogue or even her milk for her children, but in a symbolic sense. Uh, the, the emotional and moral decisions that we make will have uh, you know, ramifications um, and consequences later down the line and it must be paid, okay? not should be paid, not may be paid. He uses an imperative verb there in terms of must. There's no getting around this, this is what will happen. As each like each other as two new pins, this is a reference to Eddie and Mickey when they are born, uh, brings into, uh, you know, into play ideas between nature versus nurture, which is to do with Skinner, the idea that, you know, are we victims of circumstance and our environment or are we, uh, you know, do we develop because of our genetic tendencies? Uh, it's an interesting debate that is shown through Eddie and Mickey uh, in the course of the play. He mentions the, 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 the twins' impending death till the day they died. Um, this is at the very start of the play. Remember that the play has a cyclical nature. We see the end at the beginning um, and we work our way around back to the same point. Uh, it creates a strong and powerful sense of dramatic irony and creates great tension for the audience. Again, as a sort of counterpoint to Jesus mentioned in the previous one, he constantly says, specifically to Mrs. Lyons and Mrs. Johnston, that the devil's got your number, you know he's gonna find you, he's knocking at your door. This is a constant sense of foreboding and threat that they must pay for their actions, that their, their consequences um, will come to bear on what they have done. He also mentions this idea of what the English had known to come, come to know to, as, as, uh, as class and blames superstition. Remember, Irish Catholic uh, backgrounds, audiences in Liverpool, very superstitious in nature, but also in terms of the class system within the UK. Remember Marxism, Marxist ideas of a totally classless society were popular among the working classes at the time as a reaction to Thatcherite governments that were very staunch and very harsh. Um, Margaret Thatcher had managed uh, the decline um, of many working class industrial cities in the UK um, at the time uh, of Blood Brothers sort of youth, uh, uh, sorry, Willie Russell's youth, which inspired Blood Brothers. Um, and Marxist and utilitarian ideas um, certainly lie at the heart of Blood Brothers. So I'd have a little think in the first few minutes of, well, what does the narrator say? And if you've revised the quotes and the key characters well enough, then that should only take you a matter of 30 seconds, a couple of minutes perhaps, to sit and mull over and to note a few ideas down. Once you've thought about key quotes that you could possibly use, then it might be a good idea to start to put all this together into some kind of essay plan. So in terms of this essay plan that I've, I've, um, I've typed because my writing's appalling, I might be saying about the narrator, well, it's important that he opens the play. And I want to use phrases like cyclical narrative and he appears at key points and he sets a tone of doom and fear and dramatic irony and dramatic foreshadowing. They're all really important points. And I would want to think about key scenes or even quotes. Now, remember, don't stress too much about learning these quotes word for word. If you can, that's obviously fantastic, but if you can't, you can do something called paraphrasing, which means you can basically kind of um, reinterpret or reimagine the quotations. You don't have to get them exactly right, as long as they are an approximation of what the characters say and they demonstrate that you know what you're talking about, then that's good enough. Accurate quotations is ideal, but if you need to paraphrase, that's fine as well. We also need to consider 
that the narrator is omnipresent. He is omnipotent, which means that he's almost godlike, which means he sees all, knows all. He sees the deep secrets of, uh, of all of the characters, and he keeps the momentum going in the play. He keeps the narrative moving onwards towards the inevitable tragic consequence, and he also brings the characters back to moral justice. Uh, this idea in sort of total utilitarian society that, that there must be consequences to action and people must be held to account because of their sins. Um, this also goes back to many sort of Irish Catholic and Christian views that were also shared with the audience too. This point about the, uh, the narrator keeping momentum in the play, that's particularly important. The narrator appears at key points when there's a jump in time, when the narrative moves forward. We see the boys when they are young, we see their boys when they're in their teens, and then early adulthood, and there's a scene in the second act where time moves very, very quickly with a fairground in the background, and they take photos of each other, and it's about their youth. Uh, and it's an interesting counterpoint that we see almost an entire act when Eddie and Mickey are very, very young and it feels like your childhood goes on forever, but it feels like those middle years of life, your teens, when they're 16, 18, 21, they go in a blink of an eye. And that's sort of symbolic by Willie Russell there. The narrator facilitates all this. He's the person that speaks to the audience and tells the audience how old the characters are at those points. And that all passes in the matter of minutes which is supposed to symbolise that Eddie, really, more than Mickey, has to grow up an awful lot faster, and those lost years, those lost years of youth that should be, should be the making of the characters are lost because of the society that they live in. Um, the characterizations were also really, really important when we consider all of the characters, but in particular the narrator. He's constantly dressed in black. Black, we know, has connotations of death and funerals and respect. But it's also important not just to talk about how the characters are dressed, in terms of the lighting as well. This is a play, it's on stage, and lighting and special effects are particularly important and they add very, very deep meanings. Um, it's interesting that when the lighting changes, when the narrator comes on, it goes from a natural yellow hue or colour to a kind of blue, mysterious, almost moonlight that is concentrated on him. It implies evil and mystery, um, that we don't really know what the narrator is there for. Is he there for good or is he there for evil? Um, and the lighting sort of symbolises that as well. The narrator is particularly important because he provides a bridge between the characters and the audience. This is powerful, dramatic irony. He speaks at certain points directly out of the stage and to the audience so that the audience learn the inner secrets and desires uh, and the warnings that are given to the characters. We could say that the narrator breaks the fourth wall. In Brecht theatre and modernism, uh, this was a particularly important feature. It brought almost pantomime-like qualities to very serious drama, which would engage uh, and enthrall the audience. Remember, prior to this, theatre was maybe a little bit stuffy, certainly very middle class, uh, and the working classes felt really rather alienated th from the theatre, which was an environment of tuxedos and champagne and pearl necklaces. Um, by breaking the fourth wall, the audience would be constantly on edge that characters and action might 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 sort of spill off the stage and into the crowd uh, and it brought a fun uh, and edgy nature to uh, to the audience and, and broke down certain not just barriers in terms of the fourth wall of the stage in terms of actual physical walls One, two three on stage and the audience is sat here the fourth wall thing spilling off but it, uh, it broke down social barriers in that theatre should be fun and engaging um, realism. It should, it should speak to the audience. Uh, and Blood Brothers is a really good example um, of that. The narrator in particular facilitates that because he speaks and appears uh, in strange places, speaks directly to the audience. Other points that you might consider are his interactions with other characters. And how is he different? Maybe songs that he sings. There's a contrast with some of his soft lyrics and warm feelings towards youth, and then his hard and harsh moral messages um, that, that really provide almost an allegorical um, standpoint for Willie Russell to, to hide the didactic message of the text uh, in that um, you know, consequences and actions and social injustice and, and inequality to do with Marxism and Thatcherism. So I think that should give you a minimum of six points to be able to say in response 
to this question and again uh, you should spend some time in the exam really thinking in detail about these questions what do you know about the characters or the themes that are mentioned where do they appear what do they do what do they say and what can you structure an answer around just as an example of how I might take this further in terms of an example paragraph I'll just read it through with you and identify some of the key words within this example paragraph in the naturalistic drama Blood Brothers Russell presents the narrator as an omnipresent character his ability to drift between the audience and characters creates a mysterious sense of dramatic irony and foreshadowing or that foreshadows the inevitable tragic consequence. Russell uses the narrator to drive the cyclical structure of the play um, that the audience are aware of events and the character motivation before the rest of the cast. Remember the end is at the beginning. This is most notable when Russell has the narrator say a debt is a debt so everything needs to link back to a quote. This is absolutely vital. I'll put that in a slightly different colour. If you are not using quotations in your answers, you are going to lose a significant amount of marks. Here the narrator alludes to the inevitable tragic end. Again, using words like tragic is vital. It is vital. Um, uh, that we'll see both Eddie and Mickey dead on stage, a fact already known to the audience. The notion of debt, so I'm closely analysing some of the language here, is a powerful one implies, using words like implies, so I'm making inferences, that the characters of Mrs. Lyons and Mrs. Johnson are indebted to a higher power, in this case God or the devil, which again links to his omnipotent presence. So just to wind that back a little bit, the first thing that we do is we look very, very closely at the question. And then I would think, what does this character say? And then I would think, well, how can I put that into an essay plan? And I would then start to write my paragraphs. And every time I write a paragraph, I would tick off a point so I don't repeat myself and work through my essay plan making sure that I've got quotations, making sure that I am using key terminology, and making sure that I am analysing the language really, really closely. So there's some examples of the first question. And so just to help you, I've done some examples for this second question. So the second question is, how does Russell present the ways that the character of Mrs Lyons is affected by her actions or decisions. So again, this one is specifically about Mrs. Lyons this time, and it's about her actions and decisions. Now, if you've revised all your gold information, you should be thinking about consequences, actions, fate, free will, perhaps a little bit um, from your Romeo and Juliet studies, but you'll also be thinking about nature versus nurture, Marxism, utilitarianism. All of these ideas come into play with this question. You need to first of all think about just what does Mrs. Lyons do? Where do I see her? Who is she with? How does she speak? What does she say? And then again, how, very important word, Russell presents Mrs. Lyons. Again, that means Russell's methods. So again, like before, the first thing I would be doing is I'd be thinking about, right, what does Mrs. Lyons say? First of all, she says they shall both immediately die. This is part of the curse, okay? This idea of a curse that she places upon the boys uh, that Mrs. Johnston particularly believes in. We know that she's a very superstitious and quite naive character. And we know that Mrs. Lyons is very manipulative uh, in spotting Mrs. Johnston's weaknesses and she uses that to control um, and, and to get what she wants. She also says, as a warning to Eddie that she doesn't want him to behave like them in a reference to Sammy and Ed, uh, and Mickey and Linda and she doesn't want him to behave like a horrible little boy now this brings into idea into play ideas towards nature versus nurture which is Skinner the fact that the boys are genetically identical but they are socially very very different and their social conditioning their upbringing is what draws them apart. 
through presenting these ideas in the play, Russell is really questioning whether or not society is fair. Should two people at birth of equal genetic potential and ability be given such difference and contrast in an unfair lives? That's really the debate that Russell is having in terms of the didactic message um, of the play. She says, I feel that something terrible will happen. Now this is a sense of dramatic foreshadowing, but it's important that we put down or we note down that she says that she feels it. It's a little bit like Romeo and Juliet in, um, in the Shakespeare question, where they constantly talk about their own death, they constantly foreshadow their own death, and it becomes, as with Mrs. Lyons, almost a self-fulfilling prophecy in that she keeps on saying that bad things will happen, so they inevitably